والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين Welcome to lecture number 14 in psycholinguistics This course uh, that focuses on the, the acquisition of language the use of language in processing in actual processing so in, in, uh, in understanding and speaking as well as looking at or trying to understand how uh, people process and uh, make sense of language so language processing and language representation as I promised you earlier I made a summary of everything summary probably of the book uh, and the lectures so summary of everything that we've talked about mostly um, and it's in this PDF here All right, and this should be available to you. This should be available to you. Uh, well, right now, I believe, or probably in one or two days. All right. So we are going to have a quick look at what we focused on, what we talked about in this course. So first of all, beginning concepts. This is the definition. This is the definition of. Oops, we need to change it from here, I believe. Just one second. Right. So there. This here is the definition of uh, psycholinguistics. So basically, it is mandatory. We have to memorize this definition here. I hope that you can see this marker. Right? Okay, so this is the definition, beginning concepts. We have to memorize it to know, uh, well, what is meant by psycholinguistics. I might ask you, one of the goals of psycholinguistics is, and then we'll, we'll give you one of these as an option, maybe. So, you should know this by heart. The creativity of human language. Yeah, so any part that is uh, written in bold is really important. Anything that has something in bold, like this one here, is important. So, we need to focus on uh, that as well. We need to focus on this, this part. So here, I don't expect you to memorize it by heart. I don't expect you to memorize everything, this, this whole document, by heart. No. Some parts I want you to understand. But for some parts, you need to understand and memorize as well. So here, what is meant by creativity, how language is creative. Uh, yeah, so this is just a general thing, just to read about the topic, to know what we are talking about. All right. Now, this is really important, the distinction between language, speech, and communication. We talked about that, and the first part here, in the first part, this one here, we talked about language is the primary communication system for the human species. So, this paragraph, the first one, tells us what's the difference between language, communication, and speech. Here... Speech should not be confused with language. And this is the reason, so we should know this. So let's read it together and then uh, inform ourselves as to why speech should not be uh, confused with language and why people confuse speech with language. We've talked about that previously, if you remember. Also, it is, it is tempting to focus, uh, or to confuse thought and language. It is very easy to do that. People confuse thought, thinking, 
with language. But they are actually two different things. Why? This is important. We need to understand why. Why? Because we verbalize thoughts using language. We use language. We use language to convey thoughts. That's why we confuse thought and language. Things like that. So focus on these issues. This part then, impaired language, uh, language abilities. So pathologies that have impaired their language ability. Moreover, many animals can think but cannot communicate using language. So here we have an explanation as to why language is not the same as thought. Why are they two different things? What is the reason? What is the evidence? This is the evidence. And we explain that in lecture number two, I believe. Here, communication. What is the difference between communication and language? This part focuses on it. Here we have some definitions. What is language? What is grammar? This is very important because it's in bold. So grammar. What is grammar? I might give you this word. Grammar is, and then I give you one, two, three options. So you tell me which one is the right answer. Maybe grammar, set of rules that govern the creation of sentences. The set of rules that create sentences. This is grammar. What is a lexicon? What is meant by a lexicon? The words of a language there. This is the lexicon. Here, we talked about implicit and explicit knowledge, and we talked about that in the previous lecture as well, or in, the, in lecture number 13, I believe, or number 12, lecture number 12. We talked about implicit and explicit knowledge, tacit knowledge. So knowledge of grammar and lexicon is tacit, implicit. It's unconscious in our heads, right? Then another distinction between descriptive and prescriptive grammar. This is also very important. It's written in bold. We have here you have prescriptive grammar. So, so as you can see here, it's the form of language that is accepted in academic and business circles. Is prescriptive grammar, not descriptive grammar, right? Descriptive grammar is when you describe how people use language every day. This is describe. This is the language system that underlies ordinary use. All right? But prescriptive grammar is formal language, is accepted in academic and business circles, is, uh, and also conforms to the standards. Right. This is an example, for example, here. Uh, me and Mary went to the movies. This is informal, isn't it? Because this is descriptive grammar. This is how British people speak, for example, or American people. Also here we have things in bold, so very, very important. Linguistic competence and linguistic performance. This is also very important. What is linguistic competence? This is it. The knowledge of grammar that is in a person's mind. Here, linguistic performance is the opposite. Is the use of knowledge in actual processing. Right? Now we are done with chapter 1. We look at chapter 2. We read and we, um, we try to think of possible questions that will come in the exam, for example. So, the biological basis of language. What evidence do we have that language is biological? Do we have any evidence? We have a number of arguments. Number one, language is species-specific. We talked about that. So, what is meant by species-specific? You, ne you need to read this and you should know. What is meant by species-specific? It is unique to that species. 
the system is likely to be part of the genetic makeup of members of the species. This is the meaning of species specific. It is specific to those species, to that species. Right, then argument number two. Language is uh, universal in humans. All humans uh, have language. All humans have language. All typically, typically developing, uh, you know, children have language. And that's the second argument that language is biological. It's in the body of every member of the uh, of the species, humans. Yeah. So here, for example, first of all, as you can see it first. All human babies are born with brain. This brain is genetically pre prepared to organize linguistic information. So that's argument number one. Number two, all human languages have universal properties, and we talked about that. Then, we don't need to teach language to people, especially first language learners. People eventually learn it. Just like walking. Walking is biological, isn't it? We don't teach children to walk. They just walk themselves. Language is the same. Um, yeah, so language, should we don't need to teach uh, language. Uh, it's naturally unfolding process, basically. All children will end up learning the language, acquiring it, so there's actually no need to teach uh, children language. Also, number four, argument number four, children everywhere acquire language on a similar developmental schedule. So they start with plural S, uh, then ING, then past tense ED, then S, uh, subject verb agreement, things like that. And also there is a critical period, which is, this is important because it's in bold. Can you see it? Yes, here. Yes, there is a critical period for language acquisition. What does that mean? And when is it? Most researchers agree that the optimal period, the best period for first language acquisition is before the early teen years. Teen years like 13, 14, 15, uh, and then late teen, teen years like uh, 18, 19. So before the early teen years, let's say from 10 and down, this is the best period, optimal period for language acquisition. After this, there is a critical period. No one can acquire any language if the first language is not acquired by that time. That's why it's called critical period. Then we have the story of Jeannie, who was left in a room, unfortunately, al alone without any kind of interaction. Then, uh, anatomical and physiolo physi physiological correlates for language. We have some definitions. Aphasia. If you remember last week, we talked about that. So, it's a language impairment that is linked to a brain lesion. Then we have a definition of neurolinguistics. This is also important. We need to memorize it. Then we have the distinction between Broca's area and Wernicke's area. We talked about that a lot. So in Broca's area, it's not fluent. It's not fluent. Broca, people with Broca's uh, aphasia, they, they, have, they suffer from you know, this fluency. They, don't, they are not fluent, basically. They have word-finding difficulties. They take long to give you one word. Wernicke's area, uh, Wernicke's uh, aphasia, patients with this aphasia, speak fluently, but their, their language, their, their sentences are not uh, meaning, meaningful.
All right, a grammatic here, what does that mean? Only consists of content words, no uh, syntactic or morphological structure. This picture or this figure uh, showed us where each, uh, you know, area is. So, so this one is Boca's area, this is Wernicke's area, this is the motor control area, and so on. So we need to read it. Language le lateralization. What does that mean? This is important. It's written in bold. Language lateralization. To say that language is la lateralized means that language function is located in one of the two hemispheres, either right or left. So, this is summarized for you. It, by now, I think it should be page 70-something or 90-something, but now it's summarized for you. So, for the vast majority of people, language is lateralized in the left hemisphere. You should know that. Read this one as well. Contralateral, this is really important. It's written in bold. So, what does that mean? This is it. The right side of the body is controlled by the uh, left motor and sensory areas. So, it's the opposite, basically. The right controls left, left controls the right, and so on. Dichotic listening. What is dichotic listening experiments? So you should know that. Just read. You should understand what is meant by dichotic listening. And then in dichotic listening, we mentioned that we have a right ear advantage for language. Why do we have right ear advantage? This is the reason. It's written in here. So I want you to know why. Why do we have a right ear advantage in dichotic listening experiments? Chapter 3. You can, can you see? Now we are skipping chapters. So chapter 3, we talked about the acquisition of language. Language acquisition is not possible without two crucial ingredients. One, two. A biologically based predisposition to acquire language and experience with language in the environment. We should study them. We should know what is meant by each of them. Biologically based predisposition for language. What provides us with the predisposition to acquire language? What provides us with that readiness to acquire language? It's the brain. It's the brain. And this is called the nativist model. Right? As you can see here. Developing brain pro provides the infant with a predisposition to acquire language. So this is also important. Now the language acquisition device. What do we mean by that? If you go back to the lecture, you will see it. We explained it. So you should know what is meant. What is? What do we have in the language acquisition device? We have universal grammar and acquisition strategies. Okay, what are acquisition strategies? We should know them. We should study them. All right, as infants, of course, it is very important, that, very important that we have input from, or what we call input, or positive evidence about the language, information about the language we are acquiring or learning. So the main, so this small paragraph here gives us information about positive evidence. This is important. So who are the care, t who are the providers of positive evidence? Who provide positive evidence to the child? Here we have some information, and it's really important. Yeah, here we we talked about: uh, Do we have to teach children language? No, we don't. Because ch children, at the end, will acquire language anyways. Negative evidence. What is it? It's ungrammatical language that the child hears. So we need to know that by heart. Developmental stages. We have a lot of developmental stages. A lot of stages. First of all, from before birth to 12 months. What happens? We have sensitiv sensitivity to language. We have... Uh, 
here, for example, in the first half of the first year, what happens? What do we have? We have cooing and gargling. And then the second six months, what do we have? We have babbling. True babbling starts or begins. So as you can see, when you see um, uh, something written in bold, you should, you should focus on that. Definitions, focus on definitions. Try to understand them. Uh, we have some paragraphs just for reading and understanding the content of the course. Then, from, tw from 12 to 24 months. This is the one word stage, also called holophrastic period. Why? Why is it called holophrastic period? Because each word conveys as much meaning as an entire phrase. So instead of saying a phrase, the child will only use one word. This is called holophrastic period, one word stage. All right, this is also very important, as you can see. When we acquire, when children acquire language, they have underextension or overextension. Overextension, when, when a child knows that the dog is an animal that has four legs, the next day they see a horse, but they say dog. This is overextension, overextension. Underextension is the opposite. Underextension is when you have, uh, for example, a flower. The child knows the word flower, for example. In connection to a rose. But then you show that child another, another kind of flower, maybe a tulip, but they say, I don't know what this is. This is called underextension, because they should know that this is um, you know, a flower. Or maybe if you show them another kind of dog, they know the word dog in connection to the big dog. But they see the small dog, and they, they say, we don't know what this is. They can't call it. So this is underextension. This is also very, very important. So we should know the difference between the two. When the child vocabulary reaches 50 words, two interesting things happen. One, they start putting words together, and they start to learn words very quickly. This is called vocabulary spurt. The preschool years, what happens here? What is MLU? What is MLU? Why do we, why, uh, what do we use it for? Here we have an example of a 23-month, almost two years old child. What can you notice here in the language? No morphemes or subjects sometimes missing. So when you see an example like this, I might ask you, do you think this is this can be produced by a one-year-old, the sentence, four years old, five years old, or two years old. You should know that this, these words, these phrases, can only be produced by around two-year-old ch children. So two-year-old children can actually produce sentences like this with no morphemes and with no subjects. Overgeneralization, also very important. Now we are more or less highlighting the highlighted part. So what you have here is the summary of a whole, all of the, most of the lectures. But now we are also pointing the important parts that I want you to focus on. Yeah, so children start to produce relative clauses at three or four. Then this is also very important. What do we mean by there is a considerable period between the time a child first uses a form, like a morpheme, past tense ED, and consistent use of it. We explained that before. So, so first, the child will use a morpheme, then will not use it for some for sometimes. So sometimes drop it. But then, after time, they will always use it correctly. Then later stages of development, or language development, you can uh, see it here, around 7, 8, and 9. 
uh, children start to to uh, to make derivational morphology. So I, I, I might ask you this question. Um, words, or let's say derivational morphemes, are expected from a one year old, three years old, five years old, nine years old. Mostly it's nine years old. It's more likely. Because seven, eight, nine, that's where that's where they start use it, using it. Right. The speaker producing uh, speech. This is a model for speech production. You should know what is meant by preverbal message. This is really important. Look at the diagram here. We start from left to right. And what is first in, la in language production? Lexical, decision, lexical uh, selection, syntactic representation, or phonological representation. Which one comes first? You should know that. I might ask you, which one comes first? Phonological representation or syntactic representation? In the exam, you tell me, well, syntactic representation comes first in language production. Speech errors are called slips of the tongue. You should know that. This part is also very important, unilingual mode, bilingual mode. What do we mean by that? I explained that in the lecture. So this part also is very important. Code switching, we talked about that. Tag switching, also very important. Steps for speech production. This is also very important. Planning speech before it is produced. We have five stages. We have five stages in front of you. Accessing the lexicon, simple sentence structure, creating agreement relations, complex structure, and preparing phonological representation. Then we look at them one by one. What is lexical retrieval? What is it? Remembering the word from the lexicon, from the mental lexicon. And then, a word can be retrieved using two kinds of information, meaning and sound. You should know that. You should study that. Here we have an example. Now, I might give you an example of this. Mushrooms and strawberries. Does that give us evidence? Someone, instead of saying, I, like, I feel like whipped cream and, and mushrooms, instead of saying strawberries. Is that... Does that give support that we retrieve words by their meaning or by, by their sound? By their meaning. Because strawberries, mushrooms, they are semantically related. Both are foods. Fruits, uh, fruits and vegetables. Here the opposite. Garlic and gargle. Uh, mahogany, monotony. So here we don't have... These errors show us that words are organized by their, by their uh, sounds, the sounds they contain. Again, with same with syntax, simple syntax, tip of the tongue phenomenon, anything that is in bold is really important. Yes, here we have three kinds of errors, phonological errors. All right. Uh, this actually will go down. Don't worry about that. It should be here. Yes, it should be here. The ex look at the following errors in phonology. These ones here. Instead of saying hash or grass, say has or grash. Overall, we have three kinds of errors. Segment exchange, perseveration errors, and anticipation errors. We explained them in the lecture, but here we have an explanation that is written for you to read. And don't worry about the misplacement, it will be corrected. The hearer, speech perception, and lexical access. 
the hearer's task is almost the mirror image of the speaker's task. It's almost the opposite. When you hear, you are there. Right? So first, we start from here. We have start from the signal. We start with the phonological representation first. When we hear, of course, we hear phonology. Then, words. And then after the words, it is uh, sent to syntax. And then we get the idea. All right. Perceiving speech. This is also very important. We should memorize them by heart. We explained that also bag. And that uh, there is a period in the middle in which the three sounds are co-articulated. Phonological illusions. Constructive speech perception and phonological illusions. This is important. It's written in bold. McGurk effect. This is also very important. You remember the video I showed you with uh, the, the person mouthing ga or ba or va or fa? This is called McGurk effect. And this is the description. Phoneme restoration, very important as well. Slips of the ear, just like slips of the tongue. Sometimes you mishear something. Someone speaks, and then you mishear it. You say, did you say that? He said, no, you did, I didn't say that. So this, is, this can be slips of the ear, or mongreens. This sentence here is very important as well. The difference between slips of the ear and phoneme restoration. Information processing, bottom-up and top-down information processing. Remember the example of cat food? If you meet someone in the street and they say cat food, that doesn't make sense to you. But if you live with someone in a flat, he, ha he or she has a dog, and you are going to the supermarket, and she says, cat food. Then you understand that probably he or she want me, wants me to, uh, to buy food for the cat. This is top-down because it's aided by context. If you, if you read that, it will make it easier. Yes, again, in speech perception, we have accessing the lexicon. We have evidence here, lexical decision task, very important. You should know why do we, what is lexical decision task? What do we use it for? This is the example I showed you earlier. And the explanation, impossible words, impossible, no, impossible non-words, and possible non-words. What is the difference between them here and there? Just read and you will... Uh, no, it's, if it's possible, if, if it violates English phonotactics, English phonology, then it's impossible non-word. But if it, if it sounds like English word, an English word, then this is possible non-word. All right, also this is very important. Priming, we talked about priming and the different types of priming. If we show a word first that is related or unrelated, which one, which one will make us respond faster? Of course, when the, when the first word is related semantically or phonologically. Masked priming here. Types of priming, we have semantic priming and form priming. Semantic priming, that is, if the first word is related in meaning to the second word. Form priming, if the two words sound the same. For example, uh, lake or cake, they, are, they sound the same, but they are not related semantically. Masked priming, this is masked priming, if you remember. We only show this word that is prime in the middle for 50 milliseconds. People don't notice it, but it affects how quickly they respond to this target. 
Then we have slides in lectures number uh, 11, 12, and 13. They are um, about language impairment, about masked priming, and all of that. So also, in addition to this file, you go back to the, the slides in these uh, lectures. And they are very easy, very brief. So you can have a look at them, study them. Please study this file and do your best to make guesses as to the possible questions. I pointed, I pointed the important parts, so probably now it's easier for you to understand um, how the questions are going to be and what are the most important parts of the book to focus on. Uh, studying from, well, studying from the file will, will hopefully make it easier for you to understand uh, what is needed. Um, yeah, thank you very much for your attention and for and for uh, paying attention um, to me in the lectures. Thank you for being good students. Uh, some of you are actually excellent students. I received some emails asking very, very good questions, showing me that the students actually understood the content of this course. And this is what makes me happy. When I see people eager to learn, people who want to learn more and more about language, about psychology, about uh, linguistics, and how our brains process language. So this is the content. Please read the file. If you have any questions, any concerns, do the effort first. Try to understand yourself. Ask your colleagues. Ask me in the live sessions. We have three live sessions, of course. By now, we should have two, I believe, around two or three. So be there in the live session if you have any questions and ask me. Uh, some students, unfortunately, will wait just one week before the exam. That's really not good. Language is a big thing. For you to acquire language, to learn all the, all the uh, words, it takes you long. So you should start from day one, from now. Start working, start preparing for the final exam. Because this is English, it's a language. It's impossible that someone will learn all of these words, all of the language in one day or two days. So we should start learning from today. I wish you all the best in your future, for, for your future. And uh, I pray that all your dreams come true. Thank you very much again and again. And uh, see you, inshallah, in another course. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.